and you're going to turn to Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, beginning with verse 5, as we begin our Advent sermon series on the messages of Christmas. Today's message is entitled, Not Without Hope, and we're going to look at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's easy to let this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth uh, fall through the cracks in our Christmas celebration, but it's actually a very important story to understand the whole context of what is about to take place in Nazareth. So, verse 5, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for, bur for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he had kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant for five months, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. And I apologize, I mentioned Nazareth. Bethlehem is where we all know that Jesus was born there. So uh, you know, we all have those brain lapses here. So let's talk about this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now what we learn in this story is that Zechariah and Elizabeth are faithful people. They're good people, but something was missing in their life. What was missing was a child. And actually in that custom, and even today, we still kind of look at children being kind of a symbol of the natural thing you're going to do. Uh, the, you know, when are you going to have kids is the, the line a lot of people are going to say. But these are faithful people, and especially in that custom, that they were it, you know, expected to have children. And if you didn't have children, you were kind of looked down upon by people. But you see that Zechariah, he's a member of the priestly division. Elizabeth is a good woman. And what has happened is they have, of course, prayed to God for a child. They had prayed to God for a child, but those years had long passed. Why did they long pass? Because they got old. And those people that are older uh, know that the children are less likely to come about, especially after you go through a certain change, which we will remain nameless here today. Uh, but, you know, it, it's kind of improbable that those children are going to come about. So therefore, you, you stop praying. 
And what happens is Zechariah, he's doing his regular business. He's doing the thing that you do when you're of the priestly division. And he's going in. He's offering up prayers for the people. Offering up the standard shtick of what you do when you're religious. You know about the standard shtick of what you do when you're religious. We just did it. The Lord's Prayer. Half of us don't even understand what we just said, but we do it. Uh, and if we did understand what we, would just, what we just said, it should scare us uh, because of the things that we just said in there. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Ouch. Okay. So, uh, so Zachariah is going in. He's doing his thing. And then all of a sudden, something miraculous happens. And what's, what's Zachariah's reaction is first, he's afraid. Now, isn't it interesting that a religious guy is afraid of an angel standing before him? Uh, you would think that most of us, we would be, you know, what, what you think of a religious person is we should be expecting God to move mightily in our midst. But Zechariah, he had been part of this routine. He had been, this is, this is how we go to church. This is how we go to synagogue, how we go to temple. This is how we do things. And all of a sudden, God interrupts his religious routine, and what's his first reaction is fear. By the way, whenever there's an interruption and whenever there's change in our lives, what's generally our reaction? Fear. All right. So then the Gabriel goes, do not be afraid. 365 times in the Bible, we are told that we are not to be afraid. One for every day of the year, do not be afraid. So whenever God has an encounter with people, he has to remind them, do not be afraid because how easily we sink into fear. So then the angel goes, well, here, here's what's going to happen. God has heard your prayer. Well, which prayer are we talking about? Oh, the prayer from when we were back in kids and we were asking for, you know, when we were teenagers and we were in love and Elizabeth had that nice body and I was the nice religious guy. You mean that prayer? Yes, that prayer. God heard that prayer and God was going to answer that prayer. Well, then what's the next reaction? Now, if you saw an angel and the angel tells you what's going to happen, now first you were afraid and then you're going to doubt. How can this be? I mean, I love my wife, but I look at my wife. How can this be? And this isn't the first time that God did something improbable here because remember what happened with Abraham and Sarah. The Bible tells us that Sarah's womb was dead and dried up and Abraham was as good as dead. And yet they had a kid. See, God loves to do these things where he does miraculous things where our brains cannot begin to fathom it because the only way it could happen is God. Because human beings, we try to rationalize things and we like to try to take credit for things, don't we? We like to try to take God's glory. So that's why God goes throughout history and does these things that bewilder our minds. But then Zechariah doubts, and what is the reaction to that? He goes, how can this be? Well, that is a reasonable question, is it not, my friends? I mean, to ask God, how could this happen? And how does the angel react? The angel doesn't react, well, Zechariah, let me tell you. No, the angel says, I stand before God. I'm in his presence. This is how it's going to be. And because you doubt it, you are going to be silent. Now, one of the reasons why we understand this later on in biblical context, why he had to be silent, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself could not do great miracles in the midst of the people that were doubting. And so when we have those doubts and those unbeliefs and we speak those doubts and unbeliefs, it stifles the power of God in our lives because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so what ends up happening is we claim to be a people of faith, but our faith does not line up with our actions. And so God had a whole plan, and he was not going to let Zechariah's disbelief get in the way of this plan that was going to take place, that was going to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So here you have, now, by the way, Elizabeth's reaction is totally different, isn't it? I mean, Elizabeth is happy, and now she has to remain in seclusion because, of course, if she's among religious folk, we like to talk about people, don't we? So you got to stay away from the religious folk sometimes 
that's a tough thing too, right? When you tell religious folk what God has put on your heart, and then they're like, well, that's impossible. That's not, that does not line up with our theology. That doesn't line up with our doctrine. This is not the way we do things. Sometimes the best thing that we need to do is keep silent. We need to keep silent and let God do his work in us and let God do his work among us. We always are the people that think that we can change everyone and have we realized that we can't change anyone. Okay? Only God is able to change people. So this is a story about hope. It's a story about hope and holding on to hope and that even these older people were not without hope, not without God answering their prayers. And what we all have to recognize is no matter where we are in our station in life, no matter what we've done, no matter where we are today, it doesn't matter where we came from, it matters where we're going. It doesn't matter what we did, it matters what we're going to do, and in particular, what we are going to allow God to do in us, among us, and through us. But none of us are without hope. And I see that pervade our society. We just kind of look at things and no hope. Every, I mean, if you turn on the news, I mean, that is just depression city waiting to happen. Because you get depression about what's going on in the world, and then you get to see who's sleeping with who. And you realize you're not in the middle of all that. I mean, there is a whole world that goes on when I'm in bed. I had no idea what goes on, but I talk to my students about it, and they tell me it really does happen. I go, no wonder people got all these issues. So let's look at this idea of hope. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that three things I'm locked at. There we go. Three things abide for all time. Three, three things that remain, and they are tied together. Faith, hope, and love. After everything else goes, goes away, those three things remain. Now, what we are told, now, most people have a hard time, and I'm one of those people that have had a hard time distinguishing between faith and hope. But let me try to explain it to you one of several ways here. First, faith is a gift from God. The Bible tells us that God gives us a measure of faith. God gives us a measure of faith, and what we are to do with that measure of faith is we are to exercise that faith. Now, most of us would never exercise that faith if we had no hope that, that, would act, that it would make any difference. I mean, why do you go to the gym? If you go to the gym, you go to the gym with the expectation that if I do all this stuff, if I sweat and leak and feel miserable, then I will eventually feel good, right? So you got faith is the seed that is planted. Faith is the power that's given to us there, but it is power meant to be exercised. How does it get exercised? It gets exercised in love. That is God's love for us and our love for him. That's the exercise of the Christian faith, right? Isn't it hard to keep God at the preeminence of our life? I mean, what it tells us is to love God with all our mind, soul, and understanding. But you know what, we, we have this little, jo uh, well, I joked and some people thought I was serious for a moment, but uh, at uh, choir practice, Kathy asked, who's coming to Christmas Eve service? And I said, well, I think I'm going to take it off this year because it really gets in the way of my Christmas celebration. I mean, why do I need to come to Christmas Eve service and talk more about Jesus when I got to be ready for Santa Claus? I mean, I got to get home, get in my bed, and start dreaming those dreams of gingerbread cookies and all that stuff. And why would I, you know, it just gets in the way. Jesus just, you know, one time, Don, sorry, Don, Don, I gave a sermon way back in the beginning, and there was a lot of Jesus in it. And I said, Don, how'd you like the sermon? He goes, a little less Jesus, Robin, and a little more Christmas. And we, we still joke about that. He still jokes with me on that. But you know what? That, that, that's the whole thing. But that love of God, the more I exercise that love of God and his love for us, the more I develop in his love for me, the more I will understand and be able to keep on keeping on. Because the Bible tells us as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and there will be harvest. But those of you who do planting know that you don't put a seed in the ground and come up with a plant the next day. You have to wait 
And you have to wait. And no matter how much you tell, I mean, there are people that talk to their plants. Are you one of those people? But I remember one time I stayed the night at my grandmother's house and my uncle lived there. And I slept in the basement there and it was pitch black in the basement. But he had all these plants in the basement. But he didn't tell me that at four in the morning, all the lights come on automatically and music comes on for the plants. And so four o'clock, I'm waking up and, there, and I go, why are why is the music? And then I'm trying to find the plug because, you know, you're in that in that daze and I find the plug and I pull it out. But the problem is it was on the other side of the basement and there were all kinds of things in the way. So I ended up waking up because I stubbed my toe all the way through. And then I said to him, why is the music coming on at four in the morning? And he said, because the plants like it. <laughs> So then, but then I wanted to know, did he have a conversation? Which kind of music do we like? So anyway, you get, you get my point. You get where I'm going here. But so I don't even know where I was going with that story. <laughs> but it's a good story there. Things getting in the way. But you'll, we'll, we'll make it connect later on. All right, that was a little commercial just to keep your attention. Now, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, that is a nice scriptural quote because if you say that quote, people will go, ooh, they're religious. But most of us don't know really what that quote means. And now let me tell you this. This Christmas tree, we had to decorate yesterday. And by the way, didn't the people that decorate do a good job? Yeah, yeah. But we had to decorate yesterday and we have this tree and uh, this tree is not like a tree that I have come to use before. And so we just like started tossing all these different parts down here to put together the tree. Now, we, had, we knew we had the parts for the tree. And we knew eventually it would look like a tree if the right person put it together. And thank the Lord, Kathy came and she knew immediately you put this thing and then we hook it and everybody's hooking things and then all of a sudden we have a tree. Now, what, now if it was me, it would have been four hours later and we still would not have a tree. But here's how this passage relates to that tree. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, if you look at what the dictionary says about substance, it talks about the elementary parts. It's the part of the things that we hope for. It's, so faith or were all those different tree parts there. And now we hope is what we hope that all those different parts will come together and how it will look. But what do we need in the meantime is we needed somebody to tell us how to get those parts to come together to what we were hoping for in the tree. See, Kathy had no idea she would be the centerpiece of this sermon here. But, oh, and by the way, I re remembered seed time and harvest. That's what I was talking about, things not popping up immediately. Now you got it. Okay. See, you, you know what happens to all of you, so don't pick on me. But, so here's the thing. We need directions in the middle of all that stuff, right? So we have the parts, we have the vision, but now we need the direction. Faith gives us the parts, and hope gives us the vision. And it gives us the vision. Without a vision, the Bible tells us the people perish. Because unless we have a vision, we never do anything with our faith. And what happens is if you don't do anything with your faith, what happens to your faith is it withers, it dies. God takes it away. God doesn't bless your inactive faith. And so some of us, you know, we see the Bible says, with faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. But most of us never get out of our own way, yet alone move a mountain. See, the biggest mountain that we got to move most of the time is the mountain of me, myself, and I. Amen? That's the biggest mountain we got to move. And in order to get that faith to move, you have to have hope. Faith and hope are tied together all time. They have to remain there. If you have faith but have no hope, you will never do anything about it. It's like the people that tomorrow will be the day that you will change. No, tomorrow is not a guarantee. Today is the day you can change. Today is the day that you will make a difference. Today is the day that God has given to you, and he has given you a future, and he has given you a hope, but you will never get to that hope. You will never get to the hope of a brighter tomorrow if you don't start doing what God tells you to do today.
You have to follow the instruction manual. And if you never open it up, how do you know what God wants you to do? So many people say, well, I don't know what God's will is for my life. You know what God's will ha is for your life because he has made it clear in the word of God. He has predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of his son. His will is that we would be a people that would be holy and blameless in his sight. That we would shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation. That we would be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. All those different things. That is God's will for your life. But if you are ignoring the word you are ignoring God's path to get to the hope that he has placed in your heart see most of us we have faith and we have hope but we just don't have the gumption to get up to go into that hope because you know what will what it will require is it requires us to go into the unknown that's what happened with Zachariah and Elizabeth this is unknown they're religious folk and now they're pregnant they're old and they're pregnant. People have to be talking about what kind of pill Zacharias taken. I mean, this was before the days of the little blue pill and she's pregnant and we don't understand all this. And when we don't understand something, we fear it, don't we? We fear that which we don't understand. And that's the thing, when faith comes into our life, it takes us into an area where we're not going to understand. That's why the Apostle Paul says we have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Because our senses will tell us, this is crazy, this is nuts. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people tell me I'm crazy. One day I'll believe it. Well, I am. But that's good. Because all throughout the Bible, they thought God's people were crazy. We should be crazy. I mean, two fish, five loads, feeding 5,000 people. That's crazy. But that's God. It's beyond our comprehension. This is what the Bible tells us about God's thoughts. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And we always like to use that little pithy thing. God works in mysterious ways. And then we try to figure him out. Well, we're not all that mysterious. We're not all that smart. So why should we be trying to figure God out? I can't even figure myself out. Last night, I sat down, and here I am in my beautiful house, and then I had a sugar craving. Anybody have a sugar craving? And I just went, I want ice cream. I don't need ice cream. I've eaten a lot already today, but I want it. And what did I do? I got in my car at night when I should be going to bed, and I went and bought ice cream, and I ate it. And then I went to bed. <laughs> now, that is not rational. That is not good for me. But it popped in my head. I wanted it. How many of you have things that pop in your head? See, you have a pop in your head. You don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what's good for you. Because at that moment in time, I wanted the ice cream. I have to tell you, I even disguised myself. I put a hat on. I had my scarf around because I did not look good and whenever I go to the grocery store I run into people and when I run into people they want to talk to me and then I have to be nice but at that point in time it was all about the ice cream and nothing else get out of my way so that's how we operate in our life so now what we have to understand is when we pray we are told that we are to pray in faith that we are to pray in having hope in that because what does it tell us First John 5, 15? And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Now, many people look at that passage and go, well, you know, we've all asked for things and we have not gotten them. Some of us are grateful we didn't get for what we asked. And some of us, we're still questioning why we didn't get what we asked for because it doesn't make any sense in our brains. But here's what we have to understand about this passage is the Bible also tells us that we do not know what we ought to pray for and therefore the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. The Holy Spirit translates our prayers into what is best. What's best for us, what's best for the other person, what's best for God's will, God's design. And the Bible also tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us. 
So while we're praying, what what is God's desire for us? What's the best thing for us? Well, the best thing for us is to be like him and to be with him. Amen. Right? I mean, think about it. The best thing is to be like him and then to be with him. That's why Paul said, well, if I'm here, it's, okay, it's good because I got Jesus with me and to die is gain. No matter what happens, I got Jesus with me, and he's shaping me into the likeness of Christ. But man, once I see him, I shall be like him. So the Apostle Paul had a different view of how we are to pray. That we aren't to pray with our temporary state. That isn't to say we can't come to God with our temporary things. God wants us to come to him at all with all things. But... We also have to have an eternal view of our prayers. We have to have a longer view. See, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had long given up because they looked at their timeline and they go, this doesn't match with the timeline. Let me tell you something. God doesn't care about our timeline. He's not it. And don't you wish sometimes he would get on your timeline a little quicker? I mean, I am really good about trusting God within five minutes of my prayer. After that, I take it into my own hands. Anybody there with me? I will be Holy Ghost Junior and help Jesus out with this because he has a whole universe to run. I will take this over. And whenever I do that, I mess it up. Anybody else there with me? Okay. So God gives us what we ask for, but he gives us what the desire of our hearts are. And here's what the Bible tells us about our hearts, that our hearts are deceitful and wicked. See, our hearts, they, they lie to us. The heart told me last night I wanted ice cream. The heart will also condemn me when I step on the scale and go, look what you did, fatty. Right? And you go, wait a minute, weren't you the one that just told me to get ice cream? Well, you didn't. Right? You, you know what you're feeling when you step on that scale and you get, well, and then because I'm already fat, I might as well eat more ice cream. And then I eat more ice cream, and then I step on the scale again, and what happened? A miracle did not take place. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I play, pray for the 24-hour bug before I have to go to the doctor. Anybody there with me? I'm like, I will be so thin if I get that 24-hour bug. I mean, it's just 24 hours of, God. Ah, there you go. All right, yeah, you didn't want that mental picture when you came to church, but now you got it. Okay. So God gives us the desires of our heart, but we don't know what our heart is because we can't understand it. But God knows what our heart is. God knows what our heart is. And the desire of our heart should be, and what he's making it to be, is to be with him, to be in him, and to find our source of completion in him. You know why we end up facing times of, God wants to give us give us all kinds of things. I mean, he's a loving, good, gracious father. But he's not going to give us something that's going to draw us away from him. And sometimes he has to take away things to draw us closer to him. And so that's what we have to understand. When we get onto the other side of eternity, we're going to go, aha, that's why. That's why I had to go through that heartache. That's why it didn't make any sense. Because you needed to draw me closer to yourself. And as long as I have this stuff, as long as I have what is known, human nature will stick with what is known. But God wants to move us into what is unknown because that's where we meet him. Now, Romans 8, 7 through 28 this is a message translation. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Now notice what it says, our lives of love for God. So those people that love God, those people who are in God, he's going to take the circumstances that do not appear good and may never seem good on this side of eternity or from our perception. That is very possible that it will never appear good to our understanding. But when we see him, we shall be like him. And then the Bible tells us we see through a glass darkly right now. But then when we see in the light of his perfect love and his perfect radiance, then we shall rest in that confident assurance that God's will was done. And that God is truly good all the time. 
See, it's one thing to say God is good all the time. It's another thing to say God is good all the time when you don't feel like it. And let's face it, there are many days in our lives when we don't feel like God is good all the time. And that's when we take our feelings and we introduce our feelings to our faith. And we say, I don't care how I'm going to feel about it. We are just doing it. Yesterday morning, we got up for the shower ministry. It's 7 a.m. Nick is coming to me, and I'm like, I'm, I'm just kind of miserable over there. I'm like, we got to get it set up for the shower. And I said, you know what? I've stopped asking myself how I feel. It's Saturday morning, and I got to get up at 6 in the morning to be, to be here. But I am not asking myself how I feel about this. This is something God has called us to do, called me to do. And my life could be one of the people that needs a shower. And I would hope that somebody else would get up a little early just so I could get cleaned up. My friends, we got to make sure that our feelings are not running our lives, but our faith is running our life. We cannot serve two masters, and most of us serve the master of our feelings. That's why we start things and we quit them. Just saying. But what it says here is, God knows our pregnant condition. Now, pregnancy, as I have witnessed it, because I am, I, I am glad that I am a guy and I will never be pregnant because I have watched. But those women that have been pregnant, some women have gone back and had more kids. And that is the definition of insanity. Insane love, right? I mean, that's why you do it because you... Because when you're, do, when you're going through the pregnancy thing, right, like your ankles swell up, your hormones are all over the place, nobody knows where you're at, you don't even know where you're at, you're hot, you're cold, you're sweating, you're up and down, you have cravings for all kinds of things, you're pregnant. My friends, we are pregnant, and those pains that we have, those issues that we have, are birth pains, Jesus says, getting ready to birth something wonderful in our lives. But before you can get to that baby, what do you have to do? You have to go through the morning sickness. You have to go through the swollen ankles and the swollen this and that. You want to kill your husband you for doing this to you. And then you have to push and push and push. And then finally, you get the baby. And once you get the baby, then you go, I love the baby. I do this all over again. If that's how it is with our physical pregnancy, how much greater it is with our spiritual pregnancy when we have within us the very divine nature of Jesus Christ and it is up to us to push through that pregnant condition so that it is no longer we who live but Christ who lives within us. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, We do not lose heart. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. You got to set your mind on the things that are unseen. Set your mind on the things that are eternal. And here's the thing. What we'll see is, you know what? How many of you had troubles a year ago? How many of you can name them one by one? Maybe some of you. Most of, and by, by the way, most of us can name our troubles one by one better than we can name our blessings one by one. Just saying. That's a difference of our attitude there. But here's the thing. What our troubles were a year ago, most of us end up forgetting about. Because you know why? God got us through it. And through it means he's teaching us something in it. All right. Jeremiah 29, 11 is that passage that we always like, but I want you to see the Amplified Bible version of this. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, because we always think that God's out to take away our fun, to give you a hope in the final outcome. I think I said this last week, but it's my new little line that I like. God reconciles all accounts, but he doesn't always do it at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter. God's at work in that final outcome, the final outcome. You got to have hope that it's all going to work out at the end. It may not work out to what you can see, but you have faith and you have hope that God is God and he will do what he said he will do. And look at Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
Eventually, they got the baby. It wasn't according to their timeline. I'm sure it wasn't according to the way she wanted. I mean, the older, you know, the older woman now carrying the baby. I mean, now she has all kinds of issues. She has arthritis and morning sickness. She has all the problems there. She gets it all together. But what's her, what's, what, she goes, look at what the Lord has done for me. Most of the time, by the way, the things that we complain about today are the things we asked God for yesterday. Aren't they? The things that we wanted, oh, I wanted kids. Now I want the kids out of the house. <laughs> I wanted a husband. Now I want to be alone. <laughs> that got a little more laughter than what the other one. Just saying. And for you husbands, you wanted a wife, and now you just want a maid. <laughs> Ooh, bazinga. Okay. Hey, there you go. Now, how do we strengthen hope? Let me give you some things that you can take home with you. First, set your hope firmly in Christ being glorified. Is your hope on what you want, or is your hope in what God wants? The closer we get to Jesus, the more like Jesus we will become. The more like Jesus we will become, the more like our prayer, our prayers will become like his prayers. That's why he says, ask anything in my name and it will be granted unto you. You ask according to his presence, according to what God would want, not just necessarily what you want. Now, that, that is not to say, don't take it to the extreme that you can't go to God and have your pity party. God welcomes your pity party. But here's what he always tells me to do after my pity party. Are you done? Let's go. Get over it. Okay? So go to God with your pity party. Tell him what you want. And then you go, God, but give me what I need. Give me what you want in my life. And what you want in my life is for Christ to be glorified in me, through me, and around me. Second thing, believe that God answers prayers the best way. You don't know how to do it. Kids don't know how to do it. I remember Christmas time, you know, all the advertisements, they used to say, batteries not included. And I used to interpret that to my mom to try to get her to buy something for me. And I go, mom, you don't need batteries. You don't need, because that's how I interpret it in my mind. Now, an adult goes and says, no, it just says batteries are not included. You need batteries. They're not giving you the batteries. A little kid looked at it and went, oh, it'll work without batteries. It's magic. Okay, right? And so that, that's the thing. We don't necessarily know what we should be asking for. So we need to believe that God will do what's best, even if it doesn't meet with our definition of what is best. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you just believe? See, that's the word we like to throw around at Christmas time, right? But it's an important word. Believe. Then you would see the glory of God. Amen. Believe. Okay. Third thing. Don't speak doubt and unbelief. Amen. So don't go and one, don't be doubting and unbelieving somebody else too. Because some people, some people are just those people that they just have to pop your dreams. That won't work. That can't happen. Well, one, I would challenge you whether or not you should be hanging around those people all the time. So that's the first thing. Okay, I'm not saying give them up all the time, but there's a time to, you know, just kind of back off and you can, you can go ahead and be a grouch and a Grinch, I'm going to be over here and believe in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord and trust that he can do amazing, abundant things. I worked with a woman one time. She had these childlike prayers, and I sat there and I go, that, she needs to pay her bills. She needs to do this. She needs to do that. You know what? God answered all her prayers. I mean, I would just sit there and go, I don't get it. I'm this church going. I'm reading my Bible, doing all this stuff, and she's believing She's believing. So you can be doing or you can be believing. If you're believing, you will eventually do, but you'll do what God tells you to do, not what other people are telling you to do and not what you're thinking about doing. And so what we, what we need to do is stop sitting there praying to God on one hand and then complaining on the next breath. Isn't that what we do? God, I mean, many of us probably uttered prayers during Thanksgiving time about Thanksgiving. That's me. Whenever you know, I love my family, but I always go, Lord, I need you as I go into the dinner. I need you. I need you more and more. And then what do I do? Oh, I don't like this. Why can't we have a Martha Stewart Christmas or Martha Stewart Thanksgiving? No, we don't eat it off of China. We eat off of Chinette. <laughs> And sometimes I feel like I'm an alien popped into the family, but I love my family dearly. 
But you know what I'm saying, right? Any of you do the same thing? I thank God for my family. I can't stand my family. Oh, I love joy, peace, as you're talking to God. Love, joy, peace, and then you get on the phone with your friend. Do you know what my husband did? I can't stand him. Now, here's the thing. If you give it to God, you got to speak the things of God. You need to give it entirely to God, and this is what you then do. You rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. That's what our words would be used for, and our words will then dictate our feelings will then dictate our actions we need to make sure that our words are lined up with our faith and then it all works out well there and that's why my friend Zachariah had to remain silent we might be going through years in our life where we'd never see God moving in any mighty way but at the right time God shows up let us pray here's a few reasons why people don't go to church I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really?